that you called us. You called us your own. We are children of you, sons and daughters. We worship together to lift you up. And we don't sing these words just because we can. We sing these words because we believe them. We worship you. And we're in awe of you, Lord. Your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light, lifting our sorrows, bearing our burdens, healing our hearts. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice. Hallelujah! To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice again. Sing it Hallelujah! To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Sing it Hallelujah! To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. Chains have been broken. Chains have been broken. Eyes have been opened. Mommy of tribal starting to rise. Death is defeated. We are victorious. For you are alive. To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Sing it hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice.
lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice sing it hallelujah to our God we lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice
Um, something I saw, um, I saw chess pieces, and I saw the Lord repositioning people. So don't get comfortable where you are. Um, he wants you to be pliable, and he's moving you into different positions for his purposes. So don't resist. 
um, just obey, just listen, don't question. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for each person here, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan for them, Father, that they clearly hear your voice, Lord God, that they do not question what you are speaking. Father, that they move into their right position, Lord God, and when you say to move out of that position, they will move, Lord, for you are you are placing, you are planting your church, you are planting your people to reflect your love and your glory and your mercy. So I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord, and I bless each one, Lord, that their hearts will remain pliable, pliable, Lord God, that we move, Lord Jesus. This is not the time to sit. This is not the time to sit. This is the time to move. So I thank you, Father. I break off uh, any resistance. I break off any fear. I break it off. You're needed right now in the kingdom. So I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that you will do what you said you will do. And we will see your glory, Lord. Each one will see the glory, Lord, as you say, well done, good and faithful servant. So let that resonate in your heart today. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever he says. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. And that's a good word. Hey, during this uh, last song, uh, we're just going to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And as you prepare that, you know, I just just felt impressed to remind us, you know, the gospel is the power of salvation, Paul says. It's the power to bring about healing and restoration and deliverance. And in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. I Meaning we're made right with God. It says the righteousness of God is made real and is revealed from faith to faith. You know, and the Bible says that when we idolize anything, when we put anything before our worship of God, it actually is the very thing that starts to unravel and work against God's good creation. And that is why the restoration of that starts with the worship of God from faith to faith. And, uh, you know, one of the ways that God just draws faith out of us is by revealing His faithfulness to us. And then He asks us to respond to that. When He, re if he reveals His faithfulness, He says, now respond to that. And He always asks us to give back to Him. That He may now do something with what we've given to Him. And that's part of how God brings restoration and healing to the world. And so we give our life to Him and says, oh, Okay, Lord, we've messed this up. Let me give my life to you. As an act of faith. To allow that the Lord, the Lord then can do something with that. And bring healing and restoration into your life. And so even as we come before Him now with worship, even in our finances, the Lord says, Now bring your finances to me. And let me do something with that. And we're so thankful here at River of Life that you would entrust that which you give to the Lord out of your finances to us to steward that. We really do take that serious and we're really grateful for those who sow into the work here. And I just want to thank you for doing that and I want to invite you now as we continue to worship the Lord to go ahead and bring your offering or your tithe or an alms to help those who are in need. You're welcome to do that now. You can use envelopes. You can make it out to River of Life. Just as we worship in this last song, go ahead and do that. Thank you.
found in His. Found in Your hands, fullness of joy. Every fear suddenly wiped away. Here in Your presence, all of my gains now fade away.
just really feel the Lord say that, you know, as we sang this song, the temptation is always to look to see how well we do. You know, look at yourself and see, measure yourself. Am I, am I doing good, God? Am I not? And it's always a dangerous place. And I heard the Lord say that as we behold him, we become like him. And so in his presence, in his glory is where we're changed. It's not by our ability to do better, um, try harder. We usually, you know, we feel like we're doing good for a little bit. And it's like, woohoo! And then, whoa, it's like a roller coaster ride. But when you look at him and you keep your eyes fixed on his majesty, his love, his mercy toward us when we don't deserve it, his goodness, we begin to become like him. And the scripture that comes to mind as we were worshiping, can I tell you, this is effortless change, worship and beholding him. It's effortless change. He comes and he changes us. And he says in 2 Corinthians, the word says 3.18, but we all, all of us, <laughs> with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. This word is like a mirror. This word is alive. It's the glory of God. It's him. It's his presence. And as we spend time with him, we're being, the scripture says, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the spirit of the Lord, just as by the spirit of the Lord. Amen. Hello? Oh. Woo. Well, I don't feel like sharing this because I'm not that. I must be really strong today because I'm feeling weak. Anyway, um, now I'm sure that I'm supposed to share this just with what Jamie says. But we know in Matthew, the sixth chapter, after Jesus tells him about consider the lilies of the field, consider the sparrows and how God takes care of them. And I'm going to start further down. And... Jesus said, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Who do you think Jesus was referring to, the Gentiles? Do you think the non Jews? He was referring to those who are not in covenant with God. And that is the people that we need to bring the gospel to. And then we need to examine ourselves. Are we in covenant with God? For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have, that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Consider this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. They go in tandem. They go hand in hand. The times that I have been failing in my Christian, Christian faith is when I chose to think that I could seek one and not the other. If you're not seeking the kingdom of God, you cannot lay hold upon the righteousness of God that comes by faith in Jesus Christ and sure confidence in his word. If you're trying to seek his righteousness but not the kingdom then you're going to be in uh you're going to be self-righteous because it only comes by seeking his kingdom so can please consider this church seek you first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then you will prosper yeah. wow all right come on that was good I'm thinking that was worth getting up this morning and coming to church for. That alone. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just pray. Father, you are amazing and we are just uh, so thankful this morning. Uh, to be called by your name. God, it's just amazing that uh, despite ourselves 
and all that is wrong with this world, God, you so love it that you are continually coming into it to bring us into the saving knowledge through Jesus Christ. So we just thank you, God, for your rescue of this world. We thank you for our own rescue. We thank you that you have brought us into eternal life, which is to know you and to know your son, Jesus Christ. We bless you this morning, God. We are so uh, happy to be able to gather together as a family in your name. God, we just, more than anything, we want to just be with you. God, more than anything, we just want your presence to manifest in our midst, that your name would be glorified and the world would see that you have sent Jesus. So we welcome you, Lord. We honor you, Jesus. We welcome your Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. Well, those were uh, just some amazing uh, scriptures that the Holy Spirit had for us this morning. Uh, I had another one. Maybe we'll get to it. We'll see. Uh, how, many, um, how many of you are just really sensing um, that uh, there's an awakening uh, happening right now, that God is uh, awakening in his people? or awakening his people maybe. He doesn't need to wake up, he's already awake, but, uh, and he's in us, and it's kind of like, wake up! I'm in here, let me out! And there's just an awakening, there's a stirring happening, and uh, of course, you know, we're in the, in the New England region, so I'm particularly excited about just that stirring and that awakening that is happening here in New England. And, uh, you know, it, there's just been a consistent, I mean, a really consistent uh, message, if you will, that God is bringing to awaken his people. And, uh, you know, the scripture that Mark uh, read is absolutely one of those. Seek first the kingdom of God. We are just, I mean, God is just saying, come on, seek first the kingdom of God. All the other things that we're, that we're looking at, I'm just telling you, you know, one of the things I've um, just maybe noticed more, um, it should be kind of obvious, but sometimes you forget it, and it's good to be reminded. You know, when God is moving and stirring and birthing something, so to speak, uh, when he's bringing something forth, uh, all of hell is opposed to it. You should read your Bible. Uh, there's a great picture in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and uh, there's a picture of a woman giving birth, and uh, there's a dragon just kind of waiting for that child to come out and devour that child. And uh, of course, I, I hope you, you know, if you, a lot of people just don't like to read the book of Revelation. Um, it's really unfortunate. It's one of the most powerful books in the entire Bible. I love the book of Revelation. Uh, but one thing that is really important to understand is that it is a symbolic book. <laughs> okay, how many know there isn't a literal dragon looking for a child to devour. But in a sense, there really is a literal dragon who is trying to devour a child, all right? The dragon is just a picture for the devil. And of course, the child is Jesus himself. And uh, of course, the devil is still looking to devour the Christ in you. When God wants to bring forth and birth Jesus in you, so to speak, hope you don't mind me using these kind of analogies, okay? Uh, but God does want to birth Jesus in you. And uh, all of hell wants to oppose that, wants to devour what God's trying to do in you. And uh, it just seems like, you know, we see that picture frequently. I've just been reminded recently, you know, when the people, uh, when God's people, if you go back into your Old Testament, read the book of Exodus, there was a time where the very people that God had chosen to form into a nation, at one point they ended up as slaves in a land called Egypt, which at the time was the most powerful nation on the earth. And they were enslaved to that. And at some point, you know, God says, I've seen this. And now is the day of deliverance for them. And Moses, you're the one I'm going to send. And God sends Moses in. And Moses says, you know, after arguing with God about why he shouldn't be doing this. And God should just find somebody else to do it for him. And finally, he has no choice but to go, really. And he, God sends him. And he, you know, so he goes to the Pharaoh with this message that God gave him to give, which was, it's time to let my people go. Let them go. They belong to me. Let them go to worship me. And of course, the Pharaoh took one look at Moses and said, oh, really? <laughs> Who is this God anyways? And uh, they belong to me. And as a matter of fact, if you keep up this message, I'm just going to make life miserable for them. 
And of course, the Pharaoh just made things more and more miserable. And the whole, of course, the purpose behind that was to do what? Was to distract the people from what God wanted to do. That they would get focused on their hardship and the things that were happening rather than be able to hear the word of the Lord and to be able to receive it and believe it and get excited about their deliverance and their salvation. And instead, they got, because they were, life was getting harder for them, they got distracted by that. Does that resonate at all with anybody? What's going on? I mean, <laughs> hello? You just needed to hear that, because I needed to hear it, and I just think, you know, we're all kind of in the similar boat. And there's just, this, there's just this attempt right now by the enemy to come against what God is doing. And, you know, I don't know about you, but man, it just seems like life is blowing up all over the place. <laughs> I know I'm speaking to some of you. <laughs> and uh, listen, if, if you haven't figured it out yet, let me just let you know, it's because... God is doing something right now. And it is amazing. And you know, anybody who's been in New England for a little while, you know, maybe has, has heard for a little while, hey, God's doing something. God wants to do something in New England. It's like, okay. That's, yeah. And of course, when we first heard that, it was like, yay, God's going to visit New England. This is awesome. I'm in New England. Yes, God, this is awesome. And we got all excited. And, and then all of a sudden, life began to blow up left and right. And it was like, oh, okay, it sounds like a good word, but I'm a little bit, you know, a lot going on here right now. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe we really don't want to listen to that Moses guy after all. <laughs> and then the scripture from, um, anyway, so yeah, to, to, to get back to Matthew. So, you know, Jesus' whole message, he came and he said, listen, you know, God knows about all those things. It's not that God doesn't care about the things that are happening in your life. He's aware of that. He, he, he knows. He's very aware of those things. I mean, uh, if you don't mind me just saying this and maybe just bringing a little correction, a little change of perspective, he's more aware of these things than you are and he cares more than you do. Just because you're freaking out about these things doesn't mean you care about him more than God does. He cares about these things. He does care about you. The Bible says, cast your cares upon him because he cares about you. And he cares about you in some ways really more than you do. I mean, I know we can get absorbed with ourselves. Um, and one of the messages of the Bible, one of the messages of the gospel is that, uh, you know, self-absorption is not a sign of love. It's not a form of love. It's not an expression of love. <laughs> And so being self-absorbed with yourself and concerned about all of the stuff that you think you, you need, and some of them you probably do, uh, actually isn't a sign that you're in love with, you know, you're loving yourself and that you're expressing love. <laughs> it's actually just the opposite. And, uh, and she said, listen, God, God, God is the one who really cares. He cares even more than you do. So you can, you can cast your cares upon him trusting that he cares even more than you do it's okay and you're set free the good news is you're set free from that when you realize and you receive and you believe in you the revelation that yeah God actually does care about me more than I care about me really and he cares so much better he does it better not only does he care more he cares better he's a better caregiver than you are <laughs> So we really can cast our cares upon him and it sets us free. And he says, just seek the kingdom. As I mentioned a little bit earlier in, in worship, you know, the Bible is very clear that, that, that the very thing that, that opposes God's good creation and is part of the unraveling of the good creation that he created for us is when we seek other things besides him, when, we have, when anything comes before the Lord. It's the very thing that begins to cause the unraveling. And so when you allow the enemy to bring distraction into your life, 
so that you become more concerned about what's happening in your life than actually seeking the kingdom, you're actually contributing to your own problem. Because that's the very thing, it's the very thing that unravels and works against what God wants to do in your life. Which is why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom in his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. It wasn't just sort of like a promise, hey, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. (laughs) It's not what he meant when he said that. What he meant was in seeking the kingdom first and in seeking the righteousness that comes by faith. When we put those things first, it, it, starts, to, it starts to work against the reversal. <laughs> it's the reversal of the curse, if you will. It's the reversal of that which is causing things to unravel and work against you in the first place. Amen. And I, there's just this... Um, I can't even call it a, a, a call anymore. It's like a shout in the spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit is, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit's quiet. Sometimes you really have to learn how to quiet yourself to hear God. But then there are times where he's not. Amen. Proverbs pictures wisdom at times on the street corner shouting, trying to get somebody to listen and nobody is listening. Can I just tell you, yes, there's, there's, there's a season where we also need to quiet our souls to hear God. If you're having trouble hearing God in this hour, if you're having trouble like, I'm just not sure what God is doing or doing in me or asking me or I just, it just, he just, his voice is just kind of, it just feels hard to hear right now. You probably need to, to quiet yourself. There's probably too many voices going on right now in your life. You know, most of the time, the world is noisy. The forces of darkness, if you will, are noisy. They, they, they clang. They, they try to get your attention. They try to outshout. Your problems will try to outshout the peace that God wants to give you. It's loud. And sometimes you have to learn how to quiet yourself and quiet your soul. Uh, Psalm, I think it's Psalm 131, it says, I've learned to quiet my soul like a weaning child. And that's a picture of a contentment. A weaning child is one who has nursed and is now content. And says, just like that nursing child that has nursed and is now just laying in his mother's arms, content and happy, life is good now. It says, it's the same thing when you learn to quiet your soul so that you may hear and be content in the Lord. And that's when we need to do that. But at the same time, it's like the Holy Spirit's like on the, sh- on the street corner shouting loud. I'm like, we're just having a hard time hearing. I'm having a hard time hearing sometimes. And he's shouting right now, awake, awake. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's the hour to do that. It's awesome. Mark, thank you for listening to the Holy Spirit this morning. And then 2 Corinthians, oh my goodness. And we are all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And of course, the gospel, the other message in the gospel is that if you wanna know what it looks like to really be human, if you wanna know what it looks like to be a restored, saved, whole, delivered human in the image of God, called to be image bearers. If you want to know what that looks like, look at Jesus. Not only is he God, not only does he, when you see him, he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember when his disciples, he was like, you know, talking about the Father, and they're like, oh, show us the Father. Yeah, show us the Father, Jesus. And he's like, hello. (laughs) If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he came to show us, if you want to know, you know, it's like the world is crying, will the real God please stand up? <laughs> and he, he did, he didn't just stand up, he's, he came down. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. But he also came to be a mirror for you. 
If you want to know who you are, if you want to know, now you're not the son of God, you know, when I say that, I'm talking about if you want to know who you were created to be, what you were created to be like, what your calling is, look at Jesus. And it's like looking into a mirror. And Paul says here, we look in that mirror. It's it's an unveiled face now. It's an unveiled face and we look in the mirror and we see Jesus. And when we see Jesus, we see ourselves. This is who you were designed and created to be like. You are being transformed into his image. Keep your eyes on him. The author of Hebrews says, fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Paul Paul says here, when we do that, when we gaze on him, that transformation begins to take place. And we are transformed. And that's why we worship. We don't worship because God needs an ego boost. He's having a down day and just really needs some affirmation. (laughs) I hope that's not your picture of worship. (laughs) Right? We worship because when, as we do so, we're, we're, we're lifting up within our own spirit, within our own minds. We're lifting up and we're saying, oh my goodness, he is amazing. He is beautiful. He is the truth. He's the greatest thing ever. And in doing so, we're just aligning our hearts and our minds with him. And that's why transformation does take place in worship and why worship is so key. It's, as Paul said, it was the failure to worship that plunged the world and unraveled everything that God had planned. And so the restoration of God's creation starts with being restored to worship. And then in doing so, the whole transformation process takes place. And we're called to look like Jesus. And and God is calling this forth in this hour. The world is looking for, for hope. The world is looking for, how about for glory? You know, the world seeks after glory. Ever thought about what is glory anyways? It's a word we like to use in church. Glory to God. Right? It's a good church word. It's a good preacher's word. Glory. What exactly is glory? Ever thought about it? Okay, well, glory is, it's one of those words that is, it means a lot. You're trying to compact a lot into like a word. It can be really hard to do. But it refers to the manifest presence of God. The glory of God is the manifest, tangible presence of God. It also refers to his rule and his authority, his majesty, his splendor, is all that is the glory of God. And of course, the world seeks after glory. It seeks after beauty. It seeks after authority. It seeks after power. The glory is the power of God. The world wants power. The world wants beauty. The world wants magnificence. What it's missing is the glory of God. And this is what God wants to, wants to restore. Uh, you know, the highlight, the highlight, I mentioned this last week, the highlight in the Old Testament, I think, sort of the pinnacle, if you will, the highlight, the whole, the best part of the whole Old Testament is when uh, David had prepared his son to, to build a, a temple for the Lord in, in Jerusalem. And of course, temples were very significant, especially to ancient people. And what temples represented for the ancient people, and this was very, very true for the Jewish people, the temple represented the place where heaven and earth intersected. And that's why it was represented the presence of God on the earth. It was where heaven and earth intersected. And of course, the highlight in the Old Testament, I think, is when they built a temple for the Lord and he used that as kind of a picture of something more to come. And uh, by the way, if you, you know, um, the whole Bible from beginning to end uses temple analogy, by the way. Um, a, a, a better way to even read the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, a lot of people just want to turn it into kind of a scientific explanation of creation, but in reality, it's actually a picture of temple. It's a temple picture. And if you think about the earth, it kind of has a temple thing to it, right? I mean, it's like you know, we're living like in this, we're inhabiting this place, this almost like a building. It's like a building. You've got a floor, you've got the walls, and you've got the ceiling, right? It looks kind of like from this perspective, 
like a temple. And, uh, and so the whole Bible, it ends, it begins with kind of a temple analogy and it, and it ends with a temple analogy. And it's all about heaven and earth. The Garden of Eden is what? Heaven on earth. What's the very last chapter? Heaven comes down to earth. That's the picture. And, uh, and so the temple was this representation of this. And the highlight is when they prayed after they had built this and they dedicated it to the Lord and whammo, the glory of God actually comes. And in this case, there's a, there's a visible, visible sign. It was like a blue fire that rested upon the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. It was, like, it was like this tangible, visible thing, but it was also not limited to just inside the Holy of Holies because nobody in the whole vicinity could even stand. Can you imagine what that was like? Highlighting the Old Testament. And the low light in the Old Testament, the lowest point in the Old Testament is when one of the prophets sees the glory of the Lord depart. And the good news was there was a promise, even as the glory was departing, there was a promise of a restored glory upon the earth and that there would be a temple. And a lot of people think, oh, okay, so there's gonna be another temple built in Jerusalem and it's gonna get filled with the... No. <laughs> you just stop that kind of thinking. I don't know if there'll be a building, whatever. But that's not what the prophecy was about. Jesus made it very clear. The prophecy was the restored temple is you. <laughs> you are the temple. We are the temple. That the glory is meant to be restored and the Bible said that it would be it would be more glorious it would be more amazing I mean I can't even imagine what it was like in those days when there was a building that you could walk into and literally the tangible manifest presence of God was right there in a way that people couldn't even stand and it was there was a visible blue flame but the Bible says that the glory and Paul says we have a glory that far surpasses that because you don't have to go into a building, it's in you. The glory of God in you and Paul is saying that and the spirit is saying wake up to this truth. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and in doing so, you're gonna be transformed into the very thing you were created to be in the first place. And it's going to be, it's glorious. I know most of you know that here. Most of you are believers in this room. And you've, you've tasted and you've seen that God is, is good. And you've tasted some of, that, some of that glory. I mean, I was in a, I went to the meeting last night up in Springfield. And uh, I mean, it was just, just awesome. I went for one reason only. Uh, I felt like the Lord said, go, and I'm just going to meet you there. It's just gonna just gonna be an impartation, and and uh, I love Todd White by the way. And he was one that was speaking, and he's just amazing. He's worth listening to. But I didn't go for Todd. I went because I, you know, and and they as soon as I got there, they said, "Hey, at the end, we're gonna pray for every single person." We felt like God wants us to lay hands on every person who's here, and we just want to impart what God wants to impart into you. And I was like, "I knew it. That's why I'm here. I want to hear what Todd has to say, but Todd, please be quick." what I want to get to <laughs> and like a good preacher <laughs> he wasn't <laughs> I said I don't care you know and I, I and my, my, my first thought was oh my goodness I got to preach tomorrow morning I got to be up early and normally you know my Sundays I go to bed early on Saturdays I like to be up very very early on Sunday mornings I like to get a good start I like to spend time with the Lord I like to get filled up I like to be fresh and full of energy and all that. And I'm like, oh, this is going to go long. <laughs> then I'm thinking, if they're going to lay hands on every person in this place, and I don't know, it was probably a couple of thousand or something. I don't know, it was a lot. Now I'm thinking, remember when we had the little fire tunnels that last week or the week before or whatever? It, how long did it take us? It took us like a half an hour to get like 150, 160 people through it. I'm thinking, if I do the math, holy cow, I'm going to get through it at about 4 o'clock in the morning. And my thought was, I don't know if I can stay for this. I don't know, because I, I need to get home. I need to get to bed. I need to get to sleep. I'm already exhausted. I don't even have the energy to be here right now. And, I, and it was like, you know what? No, this is why I came. I came because I really 
just wanted to have what God wanted to do. And, and I was just so hungry for that. I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, that's it. If I have to wait here until eight o'clock in the morning and drive from here to the church, that's what I'm doing. And, uh, well, thank you for that weak encouragement. <laughs> That's, that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just thought that was, was just really funny. Good for you. <laughs> nah, see, it wouldn't count now. It doesn't count. <laughs> It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Just forget it. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I walked through the, they did, it was basically like a fire tunnel style. And so I just kind of, I kind of walked through it. And they were like, okay, we got a lot of people, so you got to move. It was like, do not, it was so funny. They had people catching and stuff. If anybody slowed up, they were like, whoa, <laughs> keep on moving, man. And uh, tow trucks, they called them, right, Rick? Yeah, they were calling them tow trucks. So basically, if you stopped or got stuck in the line, zoop, they just grabbed you and zipped you right out, put you on the floor. Keep on moving, man. I loved it. I thought that was awesome. You know, hey, listen, that's okay. And uh, anyway, so I just went through, and it was just, it was just awesome. You know, I just love having people pray for you, obviously. And, and sure enough, there was just, it was like a glimpse of glory. It was like this touch of glory. And uh, I literally, I, I got home, I could not go to bed. I could not sleep. I was like vibrating all night long. I got in bed and I'm like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm just, I feel like I'm so full of energy right now, but <laughs> now it's like 1230. <laughs> I really do have to get some sleep here. <laughs> and it uh, didn't work. <laughs> I just kind of vibrated all night just about and uh, just was like, Bleh. Felt like I had about seven espressos <laughs> without the bad effect. And uh, it, was just, it was just awesome. It was just a, and, I, and I know you guys have experienced stuff. You just had all those tastes. And it was like, oh, yeah. That's what it's all about. It's like, that's what it's all about. That's it. It was glorious. And it was wonderful. And, uh, and, and Paul here, we, and the Holy Spirit just reminded us again this morning. I love these two scriptures. Uh, that, that he brought us. Um, I had the other one I was going to bring us, but I don't think we're going to get there this morning And because uh, these are more important. And, um, you know, just reminding us, seek first his kingdom. Uh, and I just hope that you will leave this morning without uh, having heard that, having heard the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning and to remind you, seek first his kingdom. Everything else that you are concerned with, all the stuff that's going into your, off, on, on in your life, you know, God is aware of it. He's not, again, he's not unconcerned. He's not distant. He's not distracted. He's not unnoticing of these things. He is intimately aware of everything going on in your life right now. He's intimately aware of every challenge, every hardship, every scheme of the enemy that wants to discourage you or distract you or, dis or depress you or, or whatever. He's aware of those things. He's got you covered. He cares. You can trust him with everything that is troubling and concerning your heart today. You can do that. He's good. He does care. Give them to him. We're going to take a moment and pray. And I, and I would say that would be one of the really good things that we can just do together this morning is whatever it is that's on your heart that is distracting you or concerning you, consuming you, let's give it to the Lord this morning. Let's cast our cares upon him because he cares about you. And you are free. Lastly, we talked about you are free to pray. Well, this morning, I want to say you are free to seek his kingdom first. You really can put his things first. You really can put his priorities in your life first in your own life. 
You do not have to withdraw from those things uh, in order to take care of the things you feel like you need to take care of in your life. Okay, that doesn't mean ignore things. God will empower you and God will make a way. But don't be consumed by them. Don't let them rob you of the joy of your salvation. Don't let them rob you from your time with the Lord. And I really feel like there's, there's some here this morning that, uh, you know, your, your own time with the Lord has really, uh, it's been hard. And, uh, you know, sometimes when there's a lot of things going on, uh, you know, we, we, again, when we get kind of consumed with those, it, it makes it hard for us sometimes to just sit with God and to be with God. Sometimes we get, we get angry. Sometimes we get disappointed. Sometimes we get disillusioned with him. And those things cause us to actually withdraw from him. And I just want to encourage you this morning, you know, cast those things upon him and come back. He just wants to, he, he wants to be with you. And, uh, and seek first his kingdom. You're free to do that. And then the second thing, that really is going forth. You know, he really does this, this, this idea, and it's not an idea, the, the truth that uh, you are being transformed into the image of Jesus is, is, is real. And it, and it looks like something in your life. And uh, when you look at him, you can say, wow, that's, that's the kind of life that I can live by faith in God, just like him. When you read the way he interacted with people, when you, when you read the perspective he had about things that are going on, uh, when you see the power that he walked in and the miracles and, and all that, that's, that's for you. That's, that's how you you're, can live Amen. as well. And that's just not like an idea. That's just not like a, like a philosophy. That's actually the greatest reality there is. And, uh, and so God wanted to remind you of, of both those things this morning and to say, hey, it's okay, wake up, wake up, you know, and sometimes when you're waking somebody up, you're kind of gentle at first, come on, come on, wake up, you know, eventually it's like, okay, wake up, eventually it's like, whoo, out of bed, <laughs> God's gentle, I'm just having fun, I'm just saying it's, there's, it's not just a quiet voice anymore. Their wisdom is shouting from the street corner. Who will listen? Who in New England will hear this? And I believe many are beginning to hear this message. We're all beginning to hear it. And uh, it's been kind of stirring for a little bit. And I think there's just been a little bit of a damper on it. And God's saying, come on, let's move. Amen? Amen. Okay, so I want to just take a little bit of time. Uh, let's just pray. To Maybe you can just put on... Some quiet music, I don't know if that helps or distracts. How many find quiet music in the background helpful when you, when you wanna pray? How many find it distracting? How uh, about evenly split? Okay, so hey, uh, Mark, here's what we're gonna do. Yeah, we're gonna play music on this side and none on this side, so we'll take care of everybody. <laughs> you know what, let's not do music. Let's just have some quiet. Let's just have some quiet before the Lord. Let's just go, and this is just as a family. Let's just let's just take a time to come before God. Let's just pray, and and uh, you know, again, if there's some if there's some distractions, concerns, uh, you got bombs blowing up in your life right now. Uh, you know, take those concerns to the Lord. And uh, you know, the way I do that when I have that is literally just you know, I I, I picture myself coming before Jesus, and just kind of handing these things over. Um, I remind myself, I remind myself of the truth that God actually does care more than I do. Uh, I think uh, for me, I remind myself that the, that the resurrection of Jesus is proof positive uh, that God can do all things um, and that his desire is for good things. So I remind myself of that, that God's got this. He's the one who brings life out of death. It's, Nothing is impossible, so I'm just going to trust him with those things. And I stay in that place. I just keep handing them, handing them back. And if I take them back, I hand them back until a peace and joy uh, begin to rise up in, in, my, in my heart and in my spirit. And I don't, I don't leave until, it's, until I'm good. And that, so that might be you this morning. Uh, you know, maybe there's just some things uh, distracting you. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Ezekiel saw just before he saw the glory depart the temple, what he saw just before it, he saw an idol standing in the temple. And he didn't tell us what it was, 
but uh, again, you know, there sometimes there are things that we we just idolize, if I can say that. We we kind of exalt them, uh, and they and when anything gets exalted above the Lord, it is officially an idol. It can be anything. It can be your time. It can be. Sometimes we idolize our rights. We have written rights to things. We whatever it could be money. I don't know, relationships, anything. And so, you know, maybe there's just some things in your own life that you've exalted above seeking God first. And it's just time to remove that idol. Uh, and so that's, you know, uh, repentance is always a good thing. Change your mind. So maybe there's that. Maybe there's cares to give to him. Maybe there's just a, just a saying, yes, God, I just want to be where you are in this hour. And I'm just giving you my yes this morning. So let's just pray quietly. I'm sorry if I interrupted you before you finished, but uh, Father, I just, I just thank you again for the time we've had together this morning. We worship you, we love you, and we are just, again, just amazed at your kindness and your grace that you have lavished upon us. And Father, more than anything, uh, we desire your presence, we desire to see the knowledge of your glory uh, spread across the entire earth. Um, Father, we just want to heed the call that is going forward uh, in this hour to seek first your kingdom and, and to recognize the truth that when we see Jesus, not only do we see you, but we see who we are designed to be. So do your thing. We know this is only something that can be done by you. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, just want to remind you before you leave and uh, go pick up your kids. If you have kids, uh, you can go back to the cafe for some fellowship as well. Uh, for f 10 minutes, actually. <laughs> then we're going to gather right back here. Um, one thing is we have a, a, a prayer gathering that we're starting on Thursday. Uh, the leadership team is coming on Thursday to pray together. And we'll be doing it for as long as we feel like God wants us to do it. And we want to invite everybody to join us. If you'd like to do that, it'll be here uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 every Thursday for the foreseeable future. And uh, if you can only come for half an hour, just come for half an hour. And that's not a problem at all. And I uh, hope you'll be able to make it. Um, the second thing is, for those who can stay in about 10 minutes, we're just going to have a little fa family gathering, a little River of Life family gathering. I want to talk to you about a few things uh, happening, particularly as it relates to our facilities. So if you uh, want to stay, you can go grab a cup of coffee. And in 10 minutes at 1130, for those who want to gather with us, I want to get your feedback. I want to share. And we want to pray. So come back at 1130 to do that, all right? So grab your kids. Grab some coffee, say hello to somebody, and uh, we'll see you guys shortly.